why is supply chain today really important? And uh, if you look at it, uh, we are in a very fast changing environment. Uh, you've got a business environment which is becoming exceedingly demanding, be it in terms of number of products that you're offering, the uh, life cycles involved to offer the product, the quality expectations from the consumer. It's not any longer about uh, just quality or just price. It's the best quality with differentiation at the lowest possible price. And there's a increased demand for customization. Uh, so, and the typical example would be, let's say in cars, you want a specific color with certain features on it, and therefore there's a demand for flexibility in terms of mass customization. And that poses a lot of challenges when it comes to the supply chain itself, be it in terms of the flexibility which is required or the delivery commitments, the ability to meet the demand at the same time, managing your costs and efficiencies. So the business environment is becoming exceedingly complex from a supply chain standpoint. And competition is increasing, so that doesn't help matters at all. What we've seen is, and uh, this is based on some research, and I'll talk about that research first before I get into some best practices, is uh, what you're seeing here is really the percentage of advantage that leading companies in their classes from a supply chain perspective have over average or below average companies. So it ranges from, in the case of parts, a 8% uh, advantage to, as far as the fulfillment and delivery cycle is concerned, as much as a 30% advantage. So what does that really mean? What do we mean when we say a leading company in supply chain actually executes that? What we did is we actually did a survey to help define what do we mean by a uh, high-performing supply chain organization. And uh, this is something which we uh, ran along with uh, two management uh, institutes uh, at Stanford and INSEAD. And we actually went to uh, 600 of the top 3,000 companies in the world. Uh, in addition to getting quantitative uh, data, we also had in-depth interviews with about 75 of those executives from supply chain functions to really understand what is it that they are doing differently relative to average companies or, let's say, uh, companies that are not in the leading class from a supply chain standpoint. And we classified these companies into four categories. Really, leaders, so these are companies, and we looked at two time buckets, 94 to 97 and 97 to 2000. So this is a bit, uh, a bit dated, but the trends uh, basis our recent survey also stand out even today. <clears throat> leaders are those companies which across those two time buckets have been above the average. There are transformers who've made a significant jump during the period 94 to 97 to, uh, 97 to 2000. Decliners are companies which have actually lost out because of the leaders and the transformers. Uh, because one of the things here is you cannot stay at the top of uh, best practices unless you're constantly innovating yourself. And of course the laggards who are just falling behind uh, from a position of strength uh, to a position of uh, disadvantage. A uh, compounded annual growth rate of capitalization for the leaders and transformers far outweighs that of the laggards and the decliners. And so uh, the business environment actually punishes you for not being efficient and rewards you for being efficient from a supply chain standpoint. So there's a direct correlation with shareholder value on supply chain performance. The other aspect that this survey really threw up is that uh, close to 90% of the uh, sample actually considers supply chain important today. And over the last three years, again a 90% believe that supply chain in the overall context of the business has actually gained in prominence and has become all the more important. So it just goes to uh, highlight the importance of supply chain management in today's uh, context. There's one common message, which is supply chain is becoming critical in their business performance and delivery of their business objectives relative to what it was three years back. And the reason for it is not hard to fathom because uh, if you look at industry to industry anywhere between 50 to 60 percent to 80 to 90 percent of your total cost can be uh, accounted for because of the supply chain itself. So from a background perspective, I guess in summary really the complex business environment is posing uh, higher demands as far as supply chain is concerned. Uh, leaders in the supply chain area actually get higher financial returns and uh, supply chain is increasingly being seen as a 
very important lever to enhance shareholder value. So managing your costs, uh, better service. Uh, so really the cost to service equation, uh, supply chain becomes crucial from that standpoint. Now diving straight into global best practices. So basis this, like I said, you know, we actually went and spoke with about 75 companies and we isolated some uh, case studies of uh, companies and it's not to say these are the only companies which are doing it but here are some examples of companies not from India, some of them also operating in India, uh, which have best practices implemented as far as supply chain is concerned. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, you can classify these best practices across four dimensions. One is around really the supply chain enabling the business strategy, something which I talked about earlier. Uh, also is matching supply and demand, and this may sound very, uh, very elementary, but uh, that's where the real challenge is. The true challenge today in the supply chain, as a lot of you who are practitioners of supply chain would know, is how do you constantly, continuously man manage and uh, uh, match your supply and demand. Next generation efficiency gains, uh, which is really about uh, continuously reducing cost, leveraging technology, uh, making sure you've got the optimal uh, environment in which you are actually getting information around your supply chain. And finally, organizational integration itself, uh, which is about uh, integration with your suppliers, your customers, uh, internally within the organization. Now I'm going to take each one of these and just talk to you about some of the case studies. And uh, I'm going to give you the highlights of what we see as some of the things which these companies are doing. Uh, here's a company uh, which has a global manufacturing footprint. Their USP of sorts as far as supply chain is concerned is really the ability to move uh, products from one plant to another fairly seamlessly. Um, so it's, it's about a flexible and an efficient supply chain and uh, it's also about rapid product introduction with rapid manufacturing location changes as required. And uh, even in India, uh, today, uh, what is touted is the flexibility and agility with which they've actually set up operations in India. So uh, from a standpoint of supply chain strategy, here supply chain strategy is at the core of the business, and it's being evidenced by the results where they manufacture sets cheaper than rivals, and their operating margins are above, if not comparable, to some of the other key companies uh, in their sector and also across sectors. TSMC, uh, semiconductors, uh, great example of uh, collaboration. The f first example which I really tr talked about and uh, just going back is about design. This example is about collaboration. And uh, this is about collaborating not just with your customers but also with your suppliers. Uh, today, if you look at TSMC, they've got uh, designs of their, uh, the components they're actually manufacturing, the, the chips. Uh, for their customers online over the web. They've got a what if analysis available as far as the uh, cost of manufacturing for that particular design is concerned for their customers. On the other end, they've actually got 24 by 7 connectivity with their suppliers. Uh, and therefore, the suppliers are completely in sync with what they're actually trying to supply through the supply chain uh, to their customers. Again, excellent returns as far as uh, financial performance is concerned. So here it's really about collaboration across the supply chain. So uh, if I look at that first pillar we talked about, which is supply chain actually enabling your business strategy. Uh, two examples, Nokia and TSMC. Matching supply and demand. Uh, an example of this is uh, the Henkel and Condis collaboration. Uh, and it's not li uh, limited only to these two. Uh, also, the other suppliers of uh, uh, Condis, and Condis is a Spanish uh, supermarket chain. Uh, what we find is that they've actually implemented CPFR, which is your collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment. So they've got complete visibility of what's lying on the shelf as far as Condis is concerned, uh, and therefore what needs to be replenished. Uh, the forecasting and planning is extremely well collaborative. And so here's an example of a best practice in the FMCG and retail sector. Next generation efficiency gains. Uh, here's an example of um, um, basically uh, two companies coming together uh, and uh, 
making sure uh, Gillette has complete visibility when it comes to the razors which are lying on the retail shelf, shaving creams and other components that they actually uh, uh, distribute through the leverage of technology. And in this particular case, it's RFID. So it's uh, uh, leveraging technology to ensure that you've actually got complete visibility of how much has moved off the shelf. So something similar, it's an extension of the CPFR uh, phenomena that we saw in the case of Henkel and uh, Condes, further to uh, leveraging technology like RFID to get su supply chain uh, uh, visibility. Danone, Coca-Cola, uh, interesting example where uh, Coca-Cola actually distributes and markets, not markets, but distributes for uh, Danone the, its water products, at least as far as the United States is concerned. And so what has uh, Danone achieved? It's achieved the uh, advantage of not having to invest necessarily in a market where uh, their position was to limit investments. Uh, therefore, they've leveraged the strength and the assets of another company which has a very extensive distribution network and ridden on top of that in order to get uh, gains in the market itself. And uh, one of the gain uh, goals of uh, Danone is really to reverse the U.S. market share losses by Evian, which is their premium uh, uh, water product. Another example, Smart. Uh, initially, not a very good success. Uh, even today, there is a mixed view as far as whether this uh, car is really a success in the European market and other uh, parts of the world. But um, as far as some of the best practices, which the difficult period has forced them to evolve is to make sure that for the three models that they actually manufacture, uh, they've got close to about 90% of the parts which are common. Uh, they've outsourced a lot of the uh, manufacturing. So here's an example of uh, making sure that you've got standard platforms, outsourcing as much as you can, modules being designed by suppliers, having just seven key suppliers seven major suppliers, that's not to say only seven suppliers, but seven suppliers provide most of the systems required for this particular vehicle. So uh, using that to leverage uh, better management of quality and cost too. Themwater, UK based, uh, an example of a company which has uh, uh, outsourced a lot of its logistics and its uh, procurement related operations. Uh, it's actually set up a joint venture which is uh, uh, called Connect 2020, which manages the complete logistics and procurement uh, functions as far as this company is concerned. So here's an example of, in their business, uh, where you're outsourcing something which is non-core to a separate entity which manages your distribution and procurement uh, functions itself. So that's on your next generation efficiency gains. We talked about Coca-Cola and the Danone uh, example, Gillette, Tesco, and also Smart and Themwater from an outsourced supply chain perspective. Coming to organizational integration, um, Whirlpool. I guess here's an example of uh, collaborating well with your extended supply chain partners, making sure you've got service level agreements which are very well understood by your suppliers uh, in order to ensure that you're managing them on the basis of the service level agreements. Uh, and there's no question of a mismatch of expectations because everything is very clearly laid out. Uh, obviously, they use other best practices like CPFR and uh, some of the other practices which we talked about, but what they do exceptionally well is manage their service level agreements with their suppliers. Saturn, uh, again an example from the automotive industry, uh, an example of how in the distribution channel they have regional hubs when it comes to stocking and managing the supply of spares to their, to their retailers who actually retail the cars and uh, also to other retailers in the market for the aftermarket. Uh, and also a clear understanding with those dealers, they, and they don't call them dealers, they actually call them showrooms, uh, their collaboration with their uh, distributors in order to ensure that they've got a back-to-back -back service level agreement with their uh, distributors in order to ensure that parts as required for service or for after sales are supplied on time. And finally, uh, Applied Mechanics, uh, an organization which has uh, exceeded uh, expectations even of theirs internally when it comes to leveraging services as a revenue, and uh, more importantly, in terms of 
completing breakdowns and minimizing the mean time between uh, repairs to a very, very large extent. So a uh, solution which is focused on the post-sale support and management as far as the organization is concerned. So I think uh, what, what I've tried to do through these examples is really talk about some of the uh, case studies of companies which are leveraging different techniques in different industries in order to maximize supply chain efficiency and optimize the design, the collaboration, and integration of their operations. And in the process, getting exceptionally good financial results, certainly above the average as far as the peer groups are concerned. What you'll also see from this set of examples is that there's no one solution fits every company answer. Um, there are basis your industry, basis your company, uh, different levers that one needs to leverage based on the competitive situation and what really works from your customer segmentation perspective. So in summary, no one size fits all approach, but really an approach which is uh, spanning. And uh, what we clearly see is that there is a direct impact as far as shareholder value is concerned. And we as an organization have done a lot of work for our clients in the area of enhancing shareholder value, uh, which is optimizing the top line and maximizing the bottom line. Uh, and what we see from a supply chain standpoint is that be it top line, which is getting 2 to 5% top line growth on the basis of certain initiatives that you take, uh, enhancing the overall contribution to your company, or costs in terms of reduction of uh, conversion, transportation, or even uh, material-related costs, uh, or optimizing the utilization of your assets, your fixed assets. There's significant benefit by focusing on supply chain matters. And uh, so I guess uh, what I'd want to do is really leave uh, you with that thought uh, going into the next presentation, which is what this supply chain design integration collaboration will help you achieve is really higher shareholder value, which in turn helps you achieve greater market capitalization, ultimately leading to higher total return for shareholders. Thank you.